Got it. Got it. Okay, great. So welcome to lecture 10. We're going to be talking about machine learning for biochemical applications. We're in the machine learning for biochemical applications class, um, and we're going to be talking about protein structure prediction today. Uh, I'm Daryl. I'm Philip. And we're going to be kind of tag teaming this. Um, so as always, please feel free to raise your hand, ask questions during, um, and we'll hopefully give you a good overview of um, what the state of the art for protein structure prediction is, and a little bit of history. I think the first question is, why does protein structure matter? Uh, so we might be um, preaching to the choir on this one, um, but we thought it would be helpful to go back to the beginning. So um, these are the four main structures of proteins kind of building up. You start with your primary structure, which is the amino acid, and then you get your secondary structure, which are the alpha helices and the beta sheets. And then those fold up into tertiary structures. Um, so the alpha helices, beta sheets, and also disordered regions start to fold around each other. And then those are typically considered to be subunits um, or proteins themselves that can fold up with other proteins or other subunits to create like dimers, homooligomers, like your huge molecular machines, that kind of thing in your quaternary structure. So um, one of the big questions has always been, is an amino acid all you need to actually predict protein structure? Um, and this question really came about um, or like started gaining steam 50 years ago. Um, and it was with this guy right here, his name was Antonsen, and he, with two other scientists, won the Nobel Prize for their work on ribonuclease A. And he really introduced the protein folding problem and had a dogma, and he, his thought was, at least for a small globular protein in its standard physiological environment, the native structure is determined only by the protein's amino acid sequence. So he really set the field on fire with this idea that you could actually predict structure just from the amino acids with with no um, other information. Yep. The holy grail of comp bio problems. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's really hard. <laughs> um, given, you know, a, a sequence and sort of treating the sequence as your initial condition, you can try to imagine all the different ways that folding can occur mechanistically and trying to keep track of, I guess, the decision tree of the folding process. Um, immensely complicated mathematically, physically. Um, and you can think that, you know, for, for every path that could possibly be taken, you might have intermediate structures. Um, and those intermediate structures might be modeled by a graph, say, on the right, um, in terms of the, the energy of that structure in that moment. Um, it might be a, a local minima in energy where you want to end at the global minima. So when you consider that, you know, each, each possible path could have its own different graph associated with it. And, presumably one path or several paths are more probable in nature, trying to figure out a generalizable solution to this problem is crazy, crazy complicated. Um, so one of the best ways to try and solve a big problem is to have a competition about it. <laughs> so starting in 1994, uh, the CASP competition began, and it's called the, the Critical Assessment of Techniques for Protein Structure Prediction. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Um, so it started in 1994 and it was biannually. So every two years they would um, have this big group where everyone would come together and they would have um, structures that weren't yet on the protein database um, where they would test out everyone's algorithms um, and, and see how well they did to be able to predict these, these new structures that weren't known yet. Um, and there were several different categories. There were some that were template based. There were other ones that were trying to um, predict contacts between proteins. And then there were other ones called ab initio, uh, which was completely from slate, like no template at all. How well could you predict these new proteins? And as you can see, the field really jumped <laughs> over the years. Um, so 10 years, they made this much progress. Another 10 years, it was like incremental progress. And then you had uh, the last four years, a, a pretty decent jump. Um, but then we're, we're still not quite there, right? Um, this graph is showing target difficulty on the x-axis and then model backbone accuracy. So for really easy targets, um, even the very first models in 1994 were doing really well. Um, but as you um, increase the target difficulty, um, we were really making not, not great progress and still had quite, quite a ways to go. Like you were only maybe a little bit over 60% accurate um, in, in the recent years. So there was still a lot of, a lot of room to grow until <laughs> um, AlphaFold 2 entered the scene. Uh, so the very first AlphaFold was in 2018, 
um, in the last CAST competition. And that was actually included in the last graph. So they were still only doing about 60% accuracy even on the, the harder templates. Um, but then in 2020, AlphaFold did a whole revamp um, of, of its system and it blew everyone out of the water, um, as you can see. So this um, graph on the very far left, that's AlphaFold. And then the, the next one below is Baker. Um, and it just like crazy blows it out of the water. Um, and this is when you saw the flurry of like Times articles of professors who have been working on this for 20 years and they were like, ah, oh, my life is over. You know, this AI algorithm came in and it's like swept the floor. Um, but then there was a lot of hope too of like, oh my gosh, we've solved this 50 year old problem or like solved this 50 year old problem. There's, there's definitely still more work to do, um, but it's definitely a huge paradigm shift in the, the protein folding and structure prediction world. Yeah. And uh, a little bit of an aside, we're going to take this week and next week to not only mention cool models, but also um, cool principal investigators who are making new and exciting models. Um, and David Baker um, is certainly one of them. So I guess just keep, keep that name in the back of your head as you go forward. Um, and one, one thing that, that, that we haven't mentioned so far, um, the original AlphaFold um, was more physically motivated than it was sequence to output motivated. So like a lot of the physical calculations that are made about intermediate structures um, in an effort to try to predict the most likely folding given a, an initial sequence um, is what basically all of these approaches took. Um, AlphaFold 2 took a different strategy, which I guess we'll start to go over here. Um, where it's motivated by a multiple sequence alignment and looking at the structural templates associated with those multiple sequences. Um, so one, one way to think about this, when people were first thinking about protein structure and how to approach this folding problem, there were kind of two main camps. One was the, the physical approach, right? Like solving energy functions and thinking of a protein as a huge molecule um, and trying to find like the minimum energy state and, and getting your fold from that. And then the other side was thinking about uh, evolution and how um, like sequences are conserved among evolution and how that informs structure. Because a lot of times when a sequence is mutating, you'll also see like a structure change that is going along in point with that mutation. Um, and so an interesting thing um, that DeepMind, which produced AlphaFold2, um, kind of brought into their thinking here was um, in terms of the protein data bank, it's been around for 15 years, but it still only has on the order of like 200,000 actually experimentally verified sequences um, that have been produced, which is not enough to actually train a full um, machine learning model on. Like that's just not enough data to actually predict uh, structures. But on the other hand, you have a crazy amount of sequencing data. Um, so you have a huge opportunity there to look for um, evolutionary similarities and, and to do um, things like informed by that. Um, so they decided to take more of that approach rather than the, the kind of energetics side, um, which is different than what their initial approach was. Not no. like a long history of current structure. What they really did is they merged those two variations of the yeah, right. in so the later the blocks they did. Yeah, the kind of the way that they, their architecture in terms of the attention blocks that they're putting together, they uh, brought the kind of energetics in that way. So, yeah, we actually have a, what, what is an MSA? Yeah. Which, which <laughs> house, um, segued really, really well into. Um, I guess the, the underlying philosophical approach to, if, if, if we're assuming that sequence is all you need to define structure, 
then if we're interested in the structure given a sequence, if we just study similar sequences and the structures that those sequences are associated with, then we can infer a probable structure given our sequence that we're interested in. Over. Yeah, so this is, I feel like most people have seen a multiple sequence alignment here. Um, but I think the big thing to point out is the very top one is the sequence that you're trying to align to the others, so the sheep. And then as you go down, you have um, like different species that also have very similar sequences in it. Does that make sense? And so uh, as Klaus was saying, you're looking um, for the overlap. So like the, you wouldn't be able to see it in this one, but um, if you could see the structure as well, maybe you'd see like, oh, um, this, it, like this, there's a mutation happening here, and then it's also happening here, and so maybe uh, these like are connected. In and yeah. It's a, so that's useful because um, when like the the two main inputs that you have for uh, for alpha fold here is you have your MSA so you have your MSA representation and then you also have your pair representation um, and the they're really like using a structural database search and, and getting templates to do the pair representation, but it's something that you can also um, have informed by the, the MSA. Um, and this is essentially, it's an R by R by C. So you have the in residues by in residues, and then you have the um, connections between those residues. So if like I and J are interacting, it would be like, a, you'd, it would be like a graph. So you'd have I in one node, J in another node, and then an arrow connecting them, and that would be the, the connection. Oh. Yes, and th this one's actually, um, I think, more of a, a graph, if that makes sense. So the, the pair representation one is, as they start. yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, the only thing that you input into the algorithm would be the sequence. Oh, yeah. And then it pulls these from databases. So, so, so yeah. In effect, yeah, you, you do give the model more than just a single string. So, that's going to happen to you, or that's also what happens? There is definitely a pre-processing step where they, they do the target database. And so I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think they are probably using some already known stuff to create this pair representation. And then it's updated in their Eva former. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the, these are essentially built. So like you could take your input sequence and then they go through a structured database search and find templates and have something kind of similar to the MSA for pairing and then generate this pair representation. And I, I'm actually not totally sure the way that they do that, but I'm assuming it's, a, it's similar to how uh, Klaus was saying it, it's built. Um, Yes. So when they were training, they like they made sure to exclude any of the actual templates, so they weren't trained. It wasn't circular. Um, but I'm not totally sure what happens nowadays. I think it might just find it and like, "Hey, it's perfect structure." <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I guess it would still percolate through the model, and so you'd have attention working on it. So yeah. you'd probably get some changes. Yeah. Um, but it, it like by all chances, it probably is finding the exact match. Um, and then taking it through. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not totally sure. What, what it looked like was just showing a connection. Um, so it was a way, actually I think it is a vector because it has direction. So it's, a, it's like a directional graph where you have I pointing towards J, that kind of thing. Um, and I, I'm assuming they, they describe them as edges um, and the nodes are the thing there, so. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry, oh, yeah, the, the, this mouse is not on that screen. Oh, that's funny. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so. Essentially, the I guess we can go on to the yeah. uh, e-performer. Oh yeah, we were talking about all that. Sorry. Um, yeah, so the e-performer, and actually, we might want to just pull up the slide of the e-performer. That was at the end, right? Yeah. That was at the end. Um, okay. Sorry. Ignore. Ignore. You haven't seen it this. We weren't sure if we wanted to actually go into this, but it, I feel like people are excited about it, so maybe we should actually look at the e-performer. Okay. So we have our pair representation and our MSA representation that was created as like pre-processing before we actually go into the alpha fold model. Um, and this is kind of under the hood of the Evo former. And the way that alpha fold describes it is they talk about it as sort of mixed attention. Um, so you have your like normal attention blocks and then you also have these kind of triangular self-attention blocks. Um, and then they make a big deal about how they're using the pair representation to inform the MSA representation and vice versa. Um, and then it runs through this entire block uh, with an outer product mean between the like mixed MSA pair representations. And then you take the pair representation and then it goes through these 40, uh, like another 48 or 47 rounds of this. Um, and then outputs the sort of weighted changes on the MSA representation. So that's that's how the Eva former works in sort of broad strokes. Um, I'm pretty sure it's in uh, like they're trained separately, and then they all kind of come together. In parallel, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, do you want me to go back to it? Yeah, maybe we should go back to it. <laughs> Just double check. Hard finding all the specific details on this one. Could you repeat your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually, my, my I, I'm wrong. I think serial. it was serially. Yeah. My understanding was that. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's totally serially. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's going through and updating 48 times. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then you output, you have your MSA. I was wrong. I'm so sorry. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, we're going back. <laughs> Should have grabbed those. Where were we? Yeah, you were here, here, right? Yeah. So then you have your uh, your changed 
MSA and your pair representation. And then in your structure module, this is where you're actually forming the backbone of your protein. Um, and so you have your pair representation going in, and you actually just take the initial, like the top single representation from the MSA. Um, and that one is like connected to your input sequence. Like that top one would be what your original input sequence is, but now it's been changed by all of the attention in the, in the EVA former. Um, and so you take your single representation, your pair representation, and then you have um, a backbone matrix, which is um, rotations and translations. And it's essentially just an initialization matrix. So all of your rotation positions for each of the residues are gonna be one, and all of your translations are gonna be at the origin. And then it takes it through the structure module and uses the MSA representation and the pair representation to essentially update your backbone um, and figure out like the right rotations of the residues um, and where they are in relation to each other. So those are like the translations and the rotations. And then outputs a uh, 3D structure. Kind of wild. Um, yeah, and then we get recycling, which is a honestly pretty crucial component of building your structure in, in future models. I don't think AlphaFold 2 lets you have recycling be a user-defined parameter, but in some future um, folding models, it is, um, because it actually does make a whole lot of difference. Um, so what recycling does is, if you're treating your initial MSA or pair representation as an initial condition, and you are having it learn a structure, um, if you take your final pair representation and single representation output from the Evo former and combine it to sort of have a closer to truth um, initial condition, and you repeat the whole process over again, um, what AlphaFold, what the DeepMind team found um, was that your 3D structure through each round of recycling will get much, much better. Um, so in AlphaFold's case, by default, it's three recycles. Um, a model we'll talk about later, Colab Fold, I think the default is five, but when it's a user-defined parameter, you could go up to like 10 or 15 recycles um, and see improvements with each recycle. Um, which structure? This, uh, 3D structure, yeah. So the, oh. the 3D structure is made up of the backbone that comes out of here. And then also uh, like it, the amino acids are decorated from the sort of single representation that you have. Um, and so I think what it does is it takes the sort of last instances of the pair representation and the MSA representation from the structure module and recycles that back into it. But you're not actually taking the, the 3D structure, you're taking um, these matrices that have already gone through the structure module and then inputting them at the beginning. So kind of like re-model with them. Yeah. From what I understand. Um, and I couldn't find a clear answer on this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it, it either like will reset a new backbone or use the backbone that it, it already has. Um, I couldn't find a clear answer on what it's doing to the backbone. <laughs> yes. Good, good, good segue. Good segue. <laughs> yeah. How do we know it works? Uh, um, so there's two main measures. Um, I mean, so one, you can uh, just compare it. If you have a known crystal structure already, you can um, look at them and see if there's any overlap. But actual confidence measures are coming from 3Ps. So they're called TLBDT, uh, PAE, and PPM. Um, so TLBDT is, they're all predicted. So the P is predicted in all of them. Um, LBDT is um, local distance difference test. Um, and that was, that came about, I think, like at the beginning of all of this protein structure folding. People wanted a way of um, figuring out whether you're actually finding the right structure or not. Um, and so literally it's like you have one protein, you have the other protein, and then locally, how far away are the residues from each other, um, if that makes sense. And so um, you can look at this. These are images from the um, AlphaFold paper where they're comparing um, LBDT values to their average PLBDT. Um, so I think they have 
it's like a small module that they use, right, to predict LDT. I'm not entirely certain what computation goes into um, computing these statistics, um, but LDDT, AE, and TM are from actual crystal structures, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and so um, because you don't have an actual crystal structure to compute these ground truth statistics, AlphaFold, the AlphaFold team uh, made algorithms to do this in silico is I think what goes into the algorithms. Yes, yeah. And then they've been able to um, figure out like a prediction of that. So even if you don't have the ground truth, you can still predict the amount of error that you would expect to see between the residues. Yes. Um, so We have found that that has always been a problem. Always with the probability of my average probability of the low probability of average probability. So no, it's that never has seen it. No, they're yeah, they're they're so in these they're basically comparing it to when you do have a ground truth, how how well does it track? And they, they have a Pretty nice comparison. Of the actual insertion. Essentially, they have a really good way of predicting it that, that tracks with uh, what, what you'd expect and what we see when we actually do have ground truth models to compare to.
What do you mean by encoding? It, it should be the same throughout. Yeah, I think I think it's just um, like your measure of where you would like the amount of error that you would be expecting. Um, and so PLBDT is happening like kind of locally. Actually, the next slide would probably be more useful for PLBDT. Um, so PLDDT is happening in like specific regions of the proteins. Uh, so the one on the left here is probably the most useful. Um, you have your per residue confidence coloring for PLDDT. Um, and very high confidence is in blue here. So you see there's like particular regions where it's really confident about the folding happening. Um, and then there's also regions where you, it, it is not confident at all. And those typically are the more disordered regions in your in your proteins. I thought you were going to say something. Um, yeah, so the, this is how PLDDT typically comes out. And then there's also kind of an average score for the whole model that will come out for like every model. Um, and if it's above 90, it's like very confident. Um, below 50, don't trust that fold essentially. Um, and those are typically disordered. But then between um, like 70 to 90 is typically well accepted in the field. I think what this thing shows is there's some internal. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And then there's also uh, the, the other measure that um, is important to look at is called predicted aligned error. And that one's a, like a per residue alignment confidence. Um, so they're looking like residue to residue. Um, are we uh, like how much error do we expect to find there, if that makes sense? Um, and it's also a similar predicted aligned error um, that tracked well. Um, and this is actually the one that. Uh, AlphaFold said uh, they, they have this great video talking about um, AlphaFold 2 and how to use it. And um, they said that never use a structure without looking at its PAE values. You want to make sure that you have um, like high confidence residues. And you'll see that it'll change over the structure similar to PLBDT as well. Um, and a lot of times you'll see like the, the most confident ones are the darkest green and then the, the um, like the lower are in the white. Um, and so you can kind of see domains forming. And then the last one, oh, yeah. Oh, well, um, an, another output statistic, it, it's not one of the three Ps that we mentioned, um, will give, well, for, for Colab fold at least, which we'll talk about later, it's sort of a re-implementation of alpha fold, but making it faster, um, will give you information on the number of MSAs used at the beginning. Um, so that you, as the individual researcher, can contextualize the output with the the the, the amount of information that it was given. So you will get that. Yeah, but it, I don't think that's wrapped up into any of these. Yeah, error scores at all. I think for the most part, it's a disordered region, so the model doesn't know what to do with it, and then it gets ranked as low confidence. So there's kind of a, there's definitely a correlation, and I think it starts, oh yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, very cool. Yeah, that does make sense. I, I think you, I think you could make that claim. Yeah, kind of make that claim. I don't know if I would like state a lot on it, but um, I think that that would be kind of the validation of like, oh, okay, yeah, AlphaFold doesn't know what to do with it. It looks like it's a sorted region, probably is, yeah. Um, some proteins that um, our lab has fed through AlphaFold, um, our understanding of the structure is that it is like structured domains tethered by unstructured regions. And in that case, the total like protein-wise PLDDT doesn't look that good. But then when you look at something like this, for instance, then you can see that the per residue confidence for the structured regions or what, what we understand to be the structured regions are really good. Um, so sometimes, you know, it'll give you a 
protein-wise aggregate PLDDT um, might not always be representative in the case of like a protein that you mentioned, um, which might have a mix of regions. Okay. Go on. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of the way of figuring out whether your folds are good or not. Um, and there's actually one other measure we didn't really touch on, um, and it's called predicted template modeling as well. Um, and, and that's a really useful one if you are, it goes from zero to one, one being highest confidence. Um, and that's the one that's typically used if you're like comparing protein to ground truth, like did you get an exact match or not? That's, that's another way to think about it. Um, so AlphaFold was a paradigm shift for sure. Um, it really opened up like a whole field um, and so many possibilities, um, but there's still lots of disadvantages to it. The yeah. number one being it's it's very slow, um, and that's actually mostly because of the multiple sequence alignment search at the beginning. Um, that takes a crazy amount of time. Um, it also needs to store the sequence database, which is about two terabytes. So that's a crazy amount of space that you need to have to run it. Um, and then when it was initially um, published, it wasn't open source. And so the field was like, this is amazing. We can't use it, which is very frustrating. So. Oh, yeah, that leads us <laughs> to uh, Rosetta Fold. Here we go. David Baker. I mentioned him before. He's back. He'll be back later um, next week when Clay talks about his non folding but still super cool models. Um, so, David Baker um, sort of took it upon himself to reverse engineer AlphaFold in a way. Um, the information that we knew being fed into AlphaFold, multiple sequence alignment and pair representation. If those are the two big pieces of information that you need to be able to infer um, predicted structure, then his approach was to do that. Um, co-evolutionary co data from sequence alignments, um, as well as using attention-based neural network architecture. Um, we're not gonna go in, like we, we have the diagram of the model here. We're not gonna go into it all that much because Rosetta Fold isn't used all that much nowadays. Um, but at the time, it was an important open source re-engineering of AlphaFold, so to speak, um, that took MSA and um, uh, pair representation. So now we have our updated disadvantages to AlphaFold, um, where Rosetta Fold filled that gap. Um, unfortunately, um, somewhere along the line, AlphaFold became open source. Um, so people still defaulted to that, um, although some still use Rosetta Folds. Um, however, it's still slow because you still have to go through a, a multiple sequence alignment search, and it is a large storage for sequence database. Um, so this is sort of where evolutionary scale modeling, the ESM crew and ESM folds um, came in to fill that need. Um, it was a meta project launched in 2022, canceled a year later, but the team is they made their own startup or they're making their own startup. Yeah, like so they got funding for a new startup. Yeah. yeah. So what they did in effect was they replaced the multiple sequence alignment with the large language model. Um, so you're sort of just embedding the patterns of multiple sequence alignment into uh, the learned patterns in the LLM. Um, it's extremely lightweight by comparison. Uh, the largest ESM2 size is 30, 36 gigabytes, um, it's tiny by comparison to the AlphaFold 2 sequence database. Um, and I've, I've set it up. It takes like no time at all. Um, it's really fast, super easy to use. Um, it's been described as leaner, simpler, cheaper. Um, these are some statistics that came out um, to try, or sorry, I, I keep on using the mouse on here thinking it shows up on here. Um, here are some statistics that they use to try to prove um, ESM comparability to alpha folds. However, notably, it's not as accurate. Um, so you do take that hit in accuracy. Um, despite being super fast and super lightweight. Um, this is a broad overview of the model um, where you've replaced the multiple sequence alignment with an LLM. Um, they say in the paper, they, they admit that they borrowed a lot of the folding and structure architecture directly from AlphaFold. So you can sort of simplify this model as take out MSA, add LLM, um, and then, of course, they needed some fine tuning in order to make that work so that the, the um, output embeddings of the LLM are compatible with the downstream steps. But in effect, this is the, the benefit 
of ESM. Yeah, that's 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 exactly how I see it as well. Yeah. It's like a proxy. You don't need, you know, huge yeah. huge graphs. Yeah, the MSA or the pair. Okay. That could be cool if you like look at the embeddings that come out of ESM two and like compare them to what you would get out. I wonder what that would so, No, it doesn't work as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not as yep. good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we sort of alluded to this holding block similar. Um, however, um, given the, it's so much faster than actually running AlphaFold 2. So they went ahead and ran basically every known sequence in the entire proteome through ESM, creating the ESM Atlas, um, which was super cool when it came out, over 700 million proteins. Um, by comparison, to this day, the AlphaFold 2 database, I think, only has 200 million proteins. Um, so if, if quantity is, is what you're looking for, then, then ESM is way to go and super cool. Um, so updated disadvantages to AlphaFold. Um, ESM, much faster but lower accuracy. Same thing with the storage database. Um, and it's open source, which is cool. So the last folding um, algorithm we're going to look at is ColabFold. This is Martin Steiniger. He's, um, he's kind of a hot shot nowadays. He's an up and comer. Um, his, he was involved on the initial AlphaFold paper. So presumably he had pretty intimate knowledge of the model and what steps of the model he as a researcher could algorithmically include. So just as with ESM, he focused on um, the multiple sequence alignment step. Um, at this point in time, he had come up with this algorithm MMSeqs2, stands for many against many sequence alignment and it's the second iteration, um, which is extremely fast at performing multiple sequence alignment across like a lot of different sequences. Um, you can download the tool separately, but more or less what he did was if ESM took the slow multiple sequence alignment and replaced it with an MM, uh, uh, an LLM, what Martin Steininger did was he just replaced the multiple sequence alignment with his own multiple sequence alignment, which is so much faster by comparison. Um, there are some other um, cool things that Martin Steininger did to improve upon um, user control of the model. Like we mentioned before, the recycling parameter where you take the output representation of the MSAs and the pair representation and you feed it back into the beginning to update the initial conditions. Um, he made that a user-defined parameter as well as um, several other steps along the process. I think you can also um, set it so that you define the number of sequences that inform the model, which can in introduce additional variability in the output model that you get. If it's less, in, if, if it's informed by less sequences, I think the logic is that um, you are less likely to converge upon a common sequence that all the models output from AlphaFold give you, if that makes any sense. Yeah, um, that's I've I've tried looking at the paper. It's pretty dense, um, and then the the manual for MMSeq two is also similarly dense. Um, I think part of the process involves um, a linear clustering scheme, which will align up to fifty percent homology, 
um, which I think gets you part of the way there, um, but I'm not confident in that, so I'm not sure. But MM62 was its own separate project that he then applied to um, AlphaFold to get ColabFold. So for, for me and, and for Daryl at least, this is the default um, folding software that we use. Most, most people use. And I think Steiniger was also responsible for creating all of the Google collabs for the upfolds and collab folds and multiverse. Um, so he also really worked hard to make it open source and super accessible for people. So you didn't even have to use command line to go online. And do it. Oh, and then a, a little fun tidbit. Um, all of his tools have an associated cat cartoon. So this is the MMC cat cartoon, and this is the collab fold um, cat cartoon. Just thought it was fun. When, when you go to his lab page, you'll see a lot of these fun little cartoons. Um, so, okay, updated disadvantages to alpha folds. Um, we have two alternatives um, to try to address the slowness issue, um, the new hotshot being collab fold. Um, and so I think this brings us to one of the last slides. Has protein folding been solved? Um, inferentially, yes, maybe. Like if, if you have a lot of sequences and structures to compare your sequence of interest to, then you can be pretty confident that what you'll get is close to reality. Um, however, this doesn't, this obviously doesn't give us a mechanistic understanding of it, um, as well as if you don't have that many sequences that align to what you're interested in, what you get, you probably can't trust that much, which might be tricky for, I guess, what's, what's it called, like edge case proteins or something like that? Yeah, like the I dark proteome type things. Um, if y'all have heard of that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of fun. Um, but sequences that haven't really like they're kind of new in terms of evolution and don't have a lot of uh, similar properties. Cool. That brings us to this. Um, yeah. <laughs> did, did you want to run us through this? Uh, I think uh, I think we're a little short on time. It, okay. it takes a little bit long to run through one of these things, and I, I think people here have already used the collabs and stuff. Um, but there are some great collabs that are available online. Um, ESM Fold and ESM Atlas. Um, ESM Folds, you I think have to install locally, but ESM Atlas, it's that um, fun, essentially like huge cluster of proteins. If you have particularly like a metagenomic protein and you wanna go look for it and see where it lands among the whole space of like 770 million proteins, that's, that's great to use. Um, if you just wanna try out Alpha fold or collab fold, these will link to collab fold notebooks that you can use. And then also, if you want to try Rosetta fold, um, you have to make an account, but the Baker Lab also has a, an online posting source for that too. Um, That's it. Last time I checked, they did, but I haven't used it in a while. And I think they're like, they shut down. Since then, have you used it? In um, I've only ran ESM fold locally, so I'm I'm not sure. But I have used their server. It was just months ago, so I'm not totally sure if it's still online. Um, but their atlas is still functioning though. Like like on their GitHub? GitHub is still yeah. there. Yeah, their GitHub's still there, and it looks like they're gonna reinvent themselves. It's just meta shut down. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a great idea. We totally should. Uh, yeah, I think Meta defunded them. They were like, we can't make money off of this, so we're done. I think that was a bit. Um, but the, the team went off on their own and I think have found some funding. So, see what happens. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, thank you all.